Cool. All right. Well, thanks, Nick. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Um, thanks for joining everyone. Um, if I've met you before, hello. If I haven't, then I hope I meet you at some point soon. Um, so um, if you've seen one of our talks or webinars before, this is probably a familiar message. So FTTX projects are hard, but they shouldn't be. And that the solution is to simplify uh, and understand the relationship between uh, data, people, tech, and processes. So um, automation and optimization of FTTX networks um, requires bringing together people with data, technology, and processes. So my goal in this webinar is to demonstrate how you can leverage data that you may already have or that you sourced from somewhere else, and then utilize our auto design technology uh, to find cost and time savings across your network rollout. Um, so by bringing network planners and engineers uh, new technology, uh, they can use that to design FTTX networks. Uh, we then reduce the burden of drawing lines and points, which is something that very few people actually enjoy. Um, so what we find is when we bring humans and machines together to automate these, these monotonous tasks, we not only create more compliant designs and accurate bill of materials, but we do so at a greater speed and reduce deployment costs. And perhaps more importantly, engineers can spend more time, more of their own time engineering and less time just drawing lines. Um, so what I've got here is just some metrics and testimonies from people that have uh, used our auto design tool fund so far. So uh, one customer saved 400 hours over the course of a month. So for a small rural telco, that's quite significant. Uh, we've also seen customers use it to support their engineering bids, and make decisions on whether to build or not to build in a certain area, uh, and just in general, have a better understanding of their CapEx for their projects earlier on in their process. Uh, so our goal is to use technology across the entire rollout of FTTX networks. So previously we've done this by using our own software, running it internally as a service. So what we're doing now is working on getting engineers, planners, and construction managers to use this technology themselves. Um, so we're going to start simple. That's what we're doing now by providing technology to produce a design that lacks some detail like splice tables uh, and where users have less control over the design itself. So we're at that stage in the bottom left of this graph at the moment where FON's really good for doing feasibility designs. Um, so uh, moving forward, um, where we're at the moment in terms of development is adding more detail and control to FON. And as we do this, the technology can be used to create high level and construction grade designs. So the way we're going about doing this is by working with our users as partners who inform our product roadmap and help us prioritize and test new features. So I'm going to go through, before I jump into some demos, I'm going to go through a few sort of important steps to automation. Um, so the first one is, is data is everything. So this is one of the more intimidating parts around automation. So generally speaking, when you're manually drawing up a design, you see progress from the moment you begin designing. So um, with auto design, we need to, we, we don't see that initial progress from, from the get go. We need to outlay some time at the beginning to get our input data right. And I'll explain more about what input data is as we go on. Uh, but if we don't get our input data right the first time, uh, we can see some strange results. And this can be a challenge for first time users who are used to seeing designs pro progress with um, every second of effort that they do, they'll see some progress. So what I've, what I've got here um, is sort of two designs side by side. So you can see the one on the left, um, we've got a lot of address points being connected with those red cables, which are drops um, back through someone else's backyard. And the design on the right, we don't see that problem. The difference between these two designs is the input data that was used to create them. So uh, all of those circles with the ones next to them, they're the address points with a single unit of demand. And the orange lines that you see over the map uh, is the input data that we've, that we've given Font. So what that is saying to Font is these are the places where you can lay cables. So you can see on the left, we don't have, we're missing a large amount of input data. Uh, whereas on the right, we've, uh, the data has been filled in. And this is, this is common if you've, using uh, input data from perhaps a local utility company or electricity co-op, uh, or even from open street map data in rural areas, we can see some data be patchy. So the summary of this is basically, if to get going with auto design, we need to firstly make sure our input data is correct um, to ensure that the design is then correct later on. Uh, so the second step, um, so oh, second step. Uh, is a standard view of the network. Um, so what we've tried to do in Fond is provide a standard way of viewing a design. 
And this avoids a lot of the problems that we see where people use a variety of different terms to explain the same thing. Um, so we've used all of our networks, we use a tiered approach to designing and we design from the bottom up. So the first thing um, that Fond will do when it's creating a design is connect all of the addresses in the area with a drop cable back to what we call a tier one closure. The tier one closure is commonly called an MST, a NAP, a FAP, a um, terminal. Um, so we've just removed all of those different terms and we're just gonna call it a tier one closure for now. Uh, the second step in the process is that uh, Fond will then connect all of those tier one closures back to the tier two cabinet. And it's gonna do that with tier two cables. And these cables are often called distribution or feeder cables. We've decided to call them tier two just to remove that, that confusion. So these tier two cabinets, they're typically the location of the primary splitters in the network. Um, so if it's a centralized split network, you'll often have one to 32 splitters in these tier two cabinets and a distributed split will have splitters in the tier one closures as well. And finally, we have the tier three cables that connect all of the tier two cabinets back to the central office uh, or often um, back to the tie-in point if, you, if you're using a duct, if you're tying into an existing fiber network. So the third sort of key thing with, with uh, automation is the holistic architecture rules. Um, so, a more automated approach to network design allows us to create these holistic networks where we're not using local optimization, but we're using global optimization. In order to achieve that, we need to use architectures, um, which are basically a set of rules that get applied to the entire design area. Um, so in this case here, um, we're using, we, we have an example of an architecture with um, up to a 96 fiber cabinet and four port closures. And that gets applied across the board in this whole design area. So now um, I'm getting sort of to the, the main part of the, of the webinar is going to, I'm going to go through a few different um, scenarios. So I'm going to go through three scenarios today. So the first one is um, we have a rural um, ISP who's looking to get, connect its high value customers first. And this is really important, especially in these rural and regional areas where the density is so low that to fund the project in those early stages, we need to get the highest value customers onto the network first. So I'm going to show you how we can use Fond um, to, to do that. So for anyone who's seen, this is someone's first time to seeing Fond, um, this is the landing page of Fond. So as you can see, this is just running in my web browser. Um, everything is run in the cloud. None of this is run on your own machine. So first time you log into Fond, you probably see no projects in your list. So we can create a new project. Uh, so the second thing I do is I name the project. So I'm going to call this uh, rural example. Uh, so as we've seen already, one thing we need to do is select the architecture. So I'm going to choose a fairly standard architecture that we see used in rural areas, uh, which is with a one to 32 split. And I'm going to use two of those uh, one to 32 splitters in a closure. And I'm going to connect all that back to an eight port closure and have a drop distance of 750 feet. And just to sort of show you how that looks, we'll have the cabinet, the tier three cabinet connecting the tier two cabinet with two one to 32 splitters in there, connecting back to these closures that have got eight ports. So another common problem that we see with um, users who'd like to use auto design is, you know, they understand the need to use input data, but they don't actually have any. So we're working um, with data providers across the US to aggregate um, the different potential sources of data. So we've got this feature called area select at the moment. Um, and we're using that on a county by county basis to collect parcel data and road data in the US. So I'm gonna do this uh, demonstration in Santa Claus, Indiana. So you can see on the map, we've got the town of Santa Claus, Indiana. Uh, I'm gonna draw a polygon using our drawing tool. And what this polygon will tell Fond is, I wanna do a design in this area and I'd like you to source the data for me. So what it's doing now is it's pulling down that address data from our servers. And you can see that appear on the screen. I'll also grab the underground path data that I'll need to serve all these addresses at this stage.
So now we've got the input data. I'm gonna do a few other things with it. Um, as I mentioned, the MDUs are a really important um, thing for rural telcos to get right early on to fund those initial stages. Um, so let's suppose that we have an MDU here that's gonna have um, 65 units in it. So it's quite a large building. Um, so I just edit that in fond and you can see now it's got 65 units of demand. And across the other side of town, we might have another large building um, that's got um, 70, 70 units. So you can see that's appeared there as 70. Everything else has just been given a default of one fiber. Um, the final thing we wanna do before we hit generate design is choose where we're gonna have our central office location uh, or tie-in point. So I'm just gonna place this on the edge of town here. Uh, so now that's all been completed, um, we're ready to hit generate design. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and do that now. So I'll talk you through how Fond is solving the problem. So it's taking all of the input data, all of the addresses in the streets and the central office and formulating a mathematical problem. Um, what it then does is begin solving it. So the first thing it's gonna do in solving that problem is uh, connecting each address back to one of those tier one closures. So we've already seen, we've chosen an architecture where we're gonna have up to eight customers being connected back to an eight port closure. Uh, and it's gonna do that within that 750 foot. So if, if a customer is more than 750 feet away from a potential closure location, it won't get connected to that. After it's chosen all the cabinet, all the closure locations, it connects those back to the tier two cabinet. Um, and it does that using those tier two cables, those green cables that we'll see in a moment. They're often called the distribution of the feeder cables. And up to, up to, up to 64 addresses can be connected back to the cabinet in this particular scenario. Uh, so now it's chosen the cabinet locations, it's gonna connect back the, those cabinets to the central office. In this step, it's also going to, this is where it will handle the MDUs as well. Uh, those MDUs are gonna be treated as demand on the tier two network rather than tier one. And once it's connected back to the central office, it counts up all the materials uh, to produce the bill of materials. Okay, so what we can see here on the, in the south, uh, east is a, a case of where we have not corrected our input data. Um, so this is this is an example, a good example of in rural areas, we don't have perfect input data. So we would need to draw this in manually and I'll show you how we can do that in a moment. Um, so what we can see though, is that um, these addresses have all been connected back to a tier, um, tier one closure. And then each of those tier one closures is getting connected back to a cabinet. Um, with, with which contains the splitters. So we've got up to 64 addresses per cabinet. And then each of those cabinets is being connected back to the um, central office. So you can also see that we've got um, these two locations where we had our MDUs earlier. So this is the one that had uh, 65 addresses in it. So it's being served with some, a dedicated cabinet. And then over on this side of town, um, we have the apartment building with 70 units in it. So what this allows a, a network operator to do is early on, see what their network would look like if they were serving their MDUs within the context of them also doing a residential design. So they can go out and build this initial feeder network to connect these MDUs, but know that that's been designed in a way that will be able to absorb all of the extra residential demand. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that we were missing some underground data as well in this section here, which led to quite a lot of bad looking design. Uh, so what I'll do is, before I jump to the next design area, is just quickly edit this. So I can literally just draw in the underground data. So at the end of the presentation, I'll come back to this and show you what that design looks like with that having been fixed up. Okay, so the next design area that I'm gonna look at. So under this scenario, we've got an electricity co-op and they wanna use their own poles and aerial, 
an aerial span um, to install a new network. Um, they know that they don't have full coverage to every home with aerial, so they're going to have to use a little bit of trenching. Uh, they, this scenario could also cover the case where they have um, existing conduit in the ground that they wanted to, to utilise for their, for their underground network. So I'll just jump back into FOND and we'll go through with this design. So in FOND, we'll choose a new project. And if anyone would like to see these designs themselves, um, let me know just um, either in the comments uh, or send me an email and I'll, um, I'll share the design with you so that you can have a look at it yourself. Anyone's able to sign up for a free account for FOND to have a look. Okay, so um, we'll select another architecture this time, something different than last time. Um, a good one for this area might be using a bigger cabinet with um, 288 ports, and we'll use an eight port closure again with a long drop. So in this case here, we've got nine splitters in that cabinet. So in this case, this would actually be an above the ground cabinet. Um, so I'll save this architecture. So unfortunately, we can't automatically source pole and strand data in the US yet. Um, what we can do is allow you to upload your own data when you have it. So that's what I'll do here. So I'll begin by uploading uh, all of the aerial spans. So these are the, um, the geometries that show which poles can be connected or are connected by span currently. So what I did there is I selected the, a shape file to upload. Um, you can also upload KML or GeoJSON. Uh, so uploads just finishing off now. And so we can see this is the start of our input data where these blue lines show everywhere where the cables will be able to run aerially. Uh, so we'll add to that the poles. So the poles are going to be the location where we can have equipment uh, or have cables hanging over or terminating or beginning on a pole as well. So. Again, um, I uploaded a shape file there. Uh, any, any coordinate reference system can be accepted. Up until recently, we've only accepted WGS84, um, but we now accept all coordinate reference systems. So yeah, you can see these poles uh, are fully snatched to the strand. In some cases, um, we'll see data come through from um, utilities where the poles are um, slightly offset from the aerial strands. So in that case, we can work with you to help you basically clean that data so that it can be used. Uh, we'll add in some addresses now. So these are the customers that will be served. So for an electricity co-op, um, this is often going to be the meter locations. Um, so I'm going to select the shape file, which is made up of the DBF, PRJ, and the shape, and I'll upload that. So now you can see all of the address points, these um, circles here. So what we'll need to do now is up upload some underground path to reach the address points that are further away from the, under from the aerial network. So um, often a utility co-op will have that information on hand. This could be existing conduit or electricity networks. So I'll upload that, I'll uploading all the street level data. And finally, um, so we can upload the central office as well. This could be, uh, it's often a substation for an electricity co-op, um, or in this case, I'll just, I'll draw it on the map. Just leaving it there. All right, so uh, we've uploaded all of the input data now. So it's always good to have a look at the input data before we hit run and make sure everything makes sense. So every address point is near some input data that it can be connected to with a cable. So um, I'm happy with that, so I'll hit Generate Design. All right, so this is gonna take a few minutes to run. Um, so what I'll do is just go back to that design I showed, I ran earlier where we edited the input data. Um, so going back, 
we've got a rural example one. So that design has been completed and you can see now that whereas before we had the drops running madly across this block here, um, Fond has now um, served this area correctly because we added in the new input data. Okay, so we'll go back to Okay, so this is uh, still running. So we're still at this stage here, it's connecting all of the cabinets um, to the closures uh, as before. Uh, a common question I get asked at this stage, usually if, if I'm doing this demo in front of someone is, um, where is this being done? So all of this, all of the maths is basically being done on um, cloud infrastructure. Um, so none of it's been run on your local machine. So that's, that's beneficial in most cases because it allows you to run multiple scenarios at once. Um, without taking up any of your own resources. So, um, you know, you can run this on a fairly standard machine and it's going to perform exactly the same as if you were running it with, you know, the latest and greatest MacBook Pro with graphics cards. So um, that, that's the that's a benefit of running everything kind of in the cloud. Um, you know, and, you know, people are concerned about things being put up in the cloud, but you, you know, talk to me about um, our data security policies if you're interested. So that design is finished. Um, let's take a look at it. So uh, as usual, I'll start by turning off these layers just to show that um, addresses are being connected back to the tier one closure. So all the closures are being mounted uh, on either a pole or in a pip. So if I turn off the closure, you can see that it's sitting on top of a pole. And then the closures are being connected back with tier two and then tier three cables. So uh, one thing I'll, I'll also show in this area because it's larger is that we've generated a bill of materials. And the so in on the map, you can see that our terminology is very generic. We're calling things tier three cable, tier two cable, which aren't really terms that most people will use. We don't, enforce that in a bill of materials. So the bill of materials is very customizable to be, and this is important because these quantities need to feed into a spreadsheet. So this bill of materials um, is created using the RUS units, um, but we can configure this to suit sort of any anyone's bill of materials. It's typically in the same structure where you have an ID or an equi you know, a quick part number, um, a description of what that is, the units you're using and then the amount and of course we can use feet if you prefer. Um, so yeah, you can see that these all, uh, each of these rules map to a certain element in the design. So um, this particular 12 fiber cable is, this quantity is gonna be calculated wherever there's a cable of size 12 that has a placement of underground. And that placement is determined based on the input data. So any, any cable that's located alongside an aerial span is going to be counted differently in the bill of materials than if it was located on an underground path. All right, we're up to the third design now. So this case here, we're going to have an engineering company needing to create a more detailed design. So what I showed earlier with an underground design, we just use street center lines to create that. And that's good for a feasibility study. What we, what we understand now is customers do want to try to take this design a step further and use it for a high level design or even a construction design. Um, so I'm going to show you how we can do that by modifying the input data to be closer to reality so that the design is then closer to reality. Uh, before I do that, I'll name this project so that if anyone wants to wants it shared, I can share it with them after the presentation. All right, so one new project, and I'll call this one uh, engineering example. So for this case, I'm gonna use a different architecture again. I'm gonna use an architecture that's um, where the MST, or the, the closures aren't just spliced into the cable, but we're gonna run them back with um, fully connectorized cables back to the cabinet. 
and that architecture is called um, this 16 from star configuration. So in this configuration, we'll have um, one 32 splitter in a, in a closure with these MSTs then connecting back within 1500 feet to the, to the cabinet location. So I'll save that. So the, uh, this case here uses some different underground path data. So I'll navigate to where that is and upload it using the, the shape file upload as we've been doing before. And I can also upload the addresses while we're waiting for the underground to upload. All right, so once that's all uploaded, Fond will zoom in to show you where it is on the map. Um, actually, this is not the one I wanted to use. My mistake, I'm gonna use a different area. So you, know, you can replace data if you've uploaded the wrong one as I have. Okay, so the difference with this underground data as opposed to the um, cent street center line data that I used earlier uh, is that you can see we're going down both sides of the road. Uh, in certain cases, we're not going down a side of the road uh, if we know we need to, to avoid something. So this can be prepared from um, by our input data team. Um, this isn't something we'd encourage you to draw manually, although you can if you'd like. Um, so with this extra detailed um, input data, Fond is going to make decisions that they're close to reality. Um, so with the addresses and the underground uh, already uploaded, the next thing I'll do is add in the central office location, which I'll draw in, place it here. Okay, and we're ready to hit generate design now. So this is a uh, fairly large design area, so it's gonna take a few minutes um, to design. So what I'll do is sort of anticipate a common question I get um, with, with, this, with this area, which is um, you can see that we've got a railroad running the, through the middle of this town. So a common question is um, how does Fon know to avoid that railroad? So the simple answer is that it doesn't unless we tell it to, to avoid it. And the way we tell it to avoid it is, using, is by using the input data um, in a different way. Um, so I'll jump over and make a new project now um, where I'm gonna modify the input data just to show you how we can do that to influence the design. So we'll use the same architecture as we're gonna use um, is this one. And I'll upload exactly the same layer as before. And I'll also upload the addresses. While I'm at it, I'll rename the project. Okay, so let's find that railroad. 
what I'm going to do is delete any segments that are running across the railroad except for this location here. So we're going to say that this is the only place we're going to allow the design to cross the railroad. Um, so I'll use the draw on map feature, uh, which in addition to allowing us to draw in segments, allows us to delete them. So if I click there, I can delete, click there, delete, it's missing from there. Let's go here. Deleting that edge there, so you can see nothing crosses there now. So, so this is how we tell Fond. This is how Fond will know not to cross at this place here. Is we've just removed um, the input data from that crossing. That's the only place you can lay cables is where there's orange. So now we've removed all of that. I'll go ahead, uh, finish editing. And I'll place the central office oops, after that's finished uploading. So I'll place the central office in around the same place as we placed uh, for the other one. Hit finish. And then hit generate design. So in another tab, I'll just open up Fond. Um, just to check on our other design as well. So engineering example three. And it seems we've run into an error. Um, I will use a different architecture then. This is a, anyone who's ever done a webinar or a software demonstration, this is someone's worst nightmare is when, an arch, is when a, you get an error in a demonstration. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use this architecture here, which I know will work. So I'll hit generate design again. I expect what happened there is um, I was using an architecture that wasn't well suited to this area. So I'll look into that a bit later. So going back to this area here, I use the same architecture. We're gonna have the same error. So we'll use the 288 port cabinet. and hit generate design. So now I'm gonna cross my fingers and hope I don't get that same error again, <laughs> so that I can show you how um, Fond, how we can tell Fond to avoid certain railway, railways and um, so this, you know, in this case here, we've we told it to avoid a, a railway. Um, you could use that same uh, feature to tell it to avoid um, a gas line if you know there's a gas line in a certain area, um, or if you um, if there was a, an existing conduit that you wanted to use on a different side of the road, you can you, you can move those editing those uh, road segments to be on the different side of the road to take advantage of that in infrastructure. So that's how we can use Fond to kind of. That's how we can get closer to reality with Fond, is by making the input data um, match reality um, more than in that, in that design we showed earlier where we had everything running down the middle of the road. So as I mentioned, that's good for a feasibility design, but for a high level design like this, we need our input data to match reality. Okay, so thankfully um, we've got past that stage before where we had that error. Uh, so it must have just been the architecture that I used was not a good fit for this area. Um, so now it's just going to connect back all those cabinet locations uh, with the uh, tier two cable and onto the central office. Um, so um, I'm trying to think of the best thing to do to speed things along a bit, but it's, I suppose it's not too bad. It's still, you know, this is an area with around 2000 homes um, and I'm running two at once to do a comparison. Um, and it'll take about five minutes end to end. So what I will do is go back and um, take a look at the aerial design and just sort of interrogate that a little bit. Maybe find some cases where we could use the input data editing again to 
to tell Fond to do something um, to correct Fond basically. So we'll look at the aerial input data again. Swift is looking for any mistakes in the in the um, in the design. One thing I can see here is we're missing an underground connection here. So you know, this is an example that's come from um, utility co-op. Uh, so you know, things aren't always perfect. So what we can do is edit this to connect um, back back over here, which then adds an extra connectivity which can allow Fond to create a better design. So what we want to do is make sure Fond knows all of the different connections that it can make. So adding an extra connectivity will improve the, will improve the potential solution. Um, so that's somewhere we can use editing tools. Um, but this design overall does look good. I mean, I use this, this area quite a lot. Um, I don't expect to see many mistakes, but um, you can always find one in the input data. Okay, so this design's complete. So this is the one where we took out the um, railroad crossings. So you can see that we don't have any cables that are going across the railroad, except for the one place where we said that it was allowed to. Um, you can also see that uh, this design does match reality a little bit more. We've only got cables going down the single side of the road, uh, or basically anywhere we've allowed, we've allowed um, cables to run down. So this particular case um, will be useful for where um, a municipality doesn't want construction to be going down both sides of the road, um, but instead wants them to be going down just um, that, that single side. So this area is almost finished as well. So I won't, I won't spend too much time, more time on this one because all we'll see is the cables will go across all three crossings. Okay, so you can see here, it's crossed it here, here, and here. So that's this is the example of why we need to use some input editing tools to tell Fond to avoid things. If we were doing this manually, the engineer would know only cross it at this one place here. It's that input data that we use to tell Fond what we already know about a local area. Okay, so getting back to the slides, that's sort of it for the demonstration so far. I'm um, just going to reiterate what we've done. So we've sort of gone through three different design scenarios. The first one we had, we designed an underground network that used a mix of single family unit and NDU demand. Um, the street sun lines are, you know, they're good for doing a feasibility study. Uh, it's good enough to help you understand what your quantities are going to be in an area, particularly the, the number of homes per route mile. Um, we can then in, edit the input data to make the design match reality. And that's what we did when we we saw that input data was missing. We drew that back in um, to, to make the design more correct. The second example we saw, we had a hybrid of an aerial and an underground fiber to the home network. So that's where we combine pole and strand and underground data to create a design um, that could be a design on top of an existing electrical network. And then the final design we did, we used a, um, a road, some, some roadside preference data. So we increased the accuracy of the input data uh, and we did that even more by editing the input data, and that uh, that then increases the accuracy of the actual design. So you, there are two you know two main ways to increase the accuracy of input data. One is that users can draw in their own input data. So if there are easements available, users can draw that in. The other is by using a data concierge service, um, where uh, designers can uh, request that our team create their input data for them um, to follow one side of the road. Okay, so um, I mean, what I've gone over is mostly related to feasibility studies. So for us, um, we, we're happy with where Fond is at the moment for creating designs that are useful for feasibility studies. Um, so now I'll sort of cover off where we're going next. So we need to shift the way that we approach the design of fiber networks to one that's more automated. Um, so we've, what we've seen here is taking that approach to fiber to the home. Um, we want to take that approach to fixed wireless, point to point, uh, and then even, even fibre to the node and fibre to the curb de deployments. 
Um, but sort of whatever sort of deployment methodology we're going to use, there are these things we need to get right um, from the get-go. The first one is we need to ensure that the input data is right. Uh, that underpins the entire process. As you saw a couple of examples through these demonstrations, if the input data is wrong, then the design is going to be wrong. So that's that's always going to be consistent. Um, we need to ensure that we're aligned between um, the partners and ourselves. So that's important. We need to make sure that uh, if we're sourcing data from a municipality or an electricity co-op, or if we're getting approval on a permit, we need to understand that um, all of those all of those communications between different parties in the in the design in the design process um, are communicating, and that can feed back into the input data that's used to create the design. And we need to ensure the right rules um, are used from the get-go. So a good example in this in this case here, I used the wrong architecture for a certain area. Um, so um, that is basically a case where um, we need to be ensuring from the outset that we're using the correct architecture rules for a certain area. And once they're agreed on, they're used throughout the project so that we get consistency in output. So we're constantly um, evolving and improving the technology that we're using, and we're learning from everyone in, from everyone in the industry. Um, so in its web state at the moment, we're aiming at it being used for feasibility studies, um, but we're we're looking to migrate it towards a more um, a tool that's used for more detailed design as well as for wireless design. Um, so having said all that, it's it's certainly possible to adapt the output of FON to be used for high level design. Um, we find that that is definitely possible when you've got the right geospatial skills in your team. So with customers that um, have got geospatial experts on their team who can manipulate uh, the output um, to, to be useful in a construction situation. Um, in the case where your geospatial skills are limited, I mean, we've got a team of people that can help you correct your input data. So that's the data concierge team. All right, so I'll um, I'll finish off now um, just by sort of some one little fun example. So when we're not actually drawing up fiber networks, we do try to have a little bit of fun and do some silly stuff. Um, so I'll just show you a, an example of that. Um, so we can create a design using our logo. So we um, we just created some input data using the VRA Networks logo, and um, you, know, you can create a design with closures and cabinets that would connect all of the different parts of BRA networks. Um, that's one little thing I wanted to show. Um, but I mean, the real, real point of that is um, we're trying to look for better ways for you to use your skills and knowledge. So it's not fun just sitting around for a week trying to optimize a subset of an area by drawing lines. Um, you know, your, your skills are much better spent by, by letting a, a machine make those decisions for you. Um, so every, every business is going to be at a different spot in regards to getting their input data right. Um, so uh, most of my time is spent working with customers to figure out their input data and establish how that they can best use Font. Um, so to, just to finish off, uh, before I hand back to Nick, um, if you're interested in using Font, please reach out to me. And, um, I'd love the opportunity to talk to you and understand the issues that you might be facing with auto design and how we could be of assistance. So I mean, I'll reach out to you after the webinar, um, but by all means, reach out to me first and uh, with any questions you've got. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll hand back to Nick now. Awesome, thanks Pat. Um, and I hope everyone uh, listening sort of got a lot out of the, the webinar. Um, so there's a few questions that have come through over uh, over that time. So um, I'll send a few your way, Pat. I'm not too sure if you can see them in the, um, the panel, but um, I guess, uh, starting up uh, earlier on in uh, the webinar, uh, we're using the feature area select. Um, so William for us, uh, William asked about whether or not the input data was only available in the US. Yeah, so at the moment, um, we're working with a partner in the US to acquire that input data. Um, the process is then to put that into a database and give, give access to it. At the moment, we haven't partnered with anyone outside of the US, um, but I definitely know of some parties in Canada and the UK that have got some good data that we could use. Um, and I know that there are some data sources in, in South Africa. So uh, the short answer is no, um, we don't, but we're looking to add in, add in uh, other markets um, as, as we need to. So if you've got a market that you're interested in, please let me know and, and we'll look at how to get data for that. 
Awesome. Um, another one that came through, um, I feel as though there are some questions here that may have been answered after they were um, asked, but we'll get back to everyone uh, answering the, all the questions after. Um, but another good question that came through is how do you limit a sub area inside a bigger area um, to design a smaller part of the town? Yeah, right. It's a good question. So, I mean, uh, a typical scenario I see this with is if someone um, has a customer where they've been asked to design an area of like 10,000 homes and just being, they've been asked to do a sample design for that area. Um, so within Fonda at the moment, um, what you upload is what we'll design. So if you were to upload 10,000 homes or and, and all the underground aerial networks to do it, it'll do that design. Um, we, if you wanted to do a subset of that, um, I can help you learn how to use a tool called QGIS, um, uh, which is just a desktop geospatial tool. Um, there are some really great um, little widgets in that that you can use to cut out the input data that you need. And then you just upload that to Fond in the same way as you normally would and, you, and run a design. Awesome. I'm, I'm not sure if that answered their question, but I hope, I hope it did. But uh, if it didn't, please please reach out and I'll, I'll try and answer it again. Yeah, and I think we've had a lot of discussions as well around how to um, work on that problem as well. Um, cause if you're yeah, a yeah, true. I mean, that's a known problem. A big, big problem that people face is, is how to do little calves. So that's something I'm looking at um, quite a lot, quite a lot at the moment is figuring out how to how to get people not having to use an external tool. How can they carve up those areas inside Fond in a way that makes sense? Awesome. Um, and then there's a uh, another one here. So what's the typical data requirement for for FOND to run effectively? Typical data requirement for it to run effectively. Um, there's a few ways of answering that. So um, the requirement in terms of size, so it runs best at the moment if we have no more than 5,000 homes in an area. It'll still run on larger areas, but we recommend you don't. We reckon you, you then cut it up into smaller areas. So around 5,000 homes. Uh, another, one, another requirement is you need to have, it has to have address data. And then at least it has to have some aerial data or some underground data. Um, the other requirements, uh, we're only able to upload a shapefile, KML or GeoJSON. So um, if you've got GDB or tab files, we don't support them at the moment. Um, we can help you figure out how to convert them over to the correct format if you need. Um, the other one is you need to make sure the projection is correct. So we support any coordinate reference system now as of about a week ago. Um, but we need to, you need to make sure that it's actually correct. Um, so if, if the coordinate system is incorrect, it'll do the design in another country probably. Um, that's, that, that's the main data requirements. Um, and then of course, if you've got any other things to consider, um, like if you have input data on gas lines and railroads and things like that, that data doesn't get uploaded to FOM, but it'll affect the way that you design your input data. So I think I've I hopefully have covered all the different ways that you can have all the different requirements we have in our data. Awesome. Uh, and there's, um, yeah, one uh, sort of more commercially minded question here, and that's uh, around how people can buy Fond and sort of how the licenses work. Yeah, so I mean, there's a, um, a monthly fee per user per month. Um, Reach out, reach out to to myself and, and Nick, and we'll um, work with you on that. The pricing is a thousand dollars per user per month. Um, it's we don't charge any extra for the number of designs you do, um, but we, you know we we do expect that if you have just if you have two users, you're just using two different licenses. So it's yeah, per, uh, one thousand per user per month. Um. Awesome. Well, I think uh, I think that should do it. There's uh, for today. Um, yeah. Thanks for everyone for joining us. Um, if you've got any more questions, um, you can see Pat's email on the screen there, um, and we'll also be in touch with the the recording of the webinar um, over the next few hours. Um, if you've got the time, there's a, an exit survey as well, uh, which will just sort of help us with the next webinars that we do and uh, sort of lining it more with, with your needs. So yeah, if you've got any questions, send it through and um
yeah have a have a great day yeah just, yeah thanks again for everyone who joined um looking forward to any more questions that come through all right bye awesome thank you